you, Lord. Praise God. What a, what a great joy to be with all of you. Abba, we love you. We honor you. We thank you for the work of your spirit in our midst. And we ask you to speak to us, to move in our midst, to give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying, to bring this conference to a climax with your presence, with your word, in Yeshua's name, amen. Isaiah chapter 32, and I wanna talk to you about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the salvation of Israel. The ministry of the Holy Spirit and the salvation of Israel. Before we read the text, I wanna show you a 30 second video clip. Last year, I was in Israel briefly, working with some friends with Jews for Jesus who had been doing outreach in very religious Jewish areas. And the last day, we were in an area that was mixed, some very religious, some more secular. And I was with a little film crew and we were interviewing people and saying, this is going to go on Christian TV and we wanna to talk to you about your beliefs in Messiah and things like that with the hope that some of them would be interested in having further conversations, in which case our colleagues were there ready to speak with them, or at the very least, it would be educational for a Christian audience. So we were trying to be forthright about who we were, and then one fellow came in with a with disruptive group. They, they try to stop the preaching of the gospel in Israel. And he starts yelling, missionary, missionary, which is a bad word. It has bad connotations there. He began yelling that to disrupt. So we basically had to stop what we were doing because we couldn't do it anymore. And then it was clear he was going to try to start trouble and get us arrested or do whatever he could to be disruptive. So some of my friends had to move on quickly because they, they were were working locally and didn't want their opportunities to be sharing the gospel to be heard. But the more that he attacked and the more he yelled, it had the opposite effect on me. And I thought, let's turn this into an opportunity to preach. I mean, since we're drawing a crowd anyway. You know, someone said, you better get out if you want to get out in one piece. I thought, well, this is why we're here, is to share the gospel. I said, when he stops yelling, then we'll leave. As long as he's yelling, we won't. So anyway, he kept following me around. And, and, and soon enough, there were you know, crowds of people. And at, at one point, I, I went over to folks at a marketplace there. And, and I, said, I said in English, I said, is it, are you allowed here to share your beliefs publicly? Is that okay? And they said, yeah. And then one of them said, what do you think about Trump? Well, I mean, it's controversial enough in America, right? You know, you say some are excited if you voted for him, some hatred if you voted for him. I said, well, I did vote for him. They go, we like him, make America great again. I thought this was not what I was expecting. <laughs> but anyway, soon there were some very religious Jews around me and one guy said I was trying to be deceptive and I'm explaining, look, people know me on internet, people know my face and we were millions of views and, and say, you know, I'm not trying to be deceptive but it leads to this little exchange here. So if we have the video clip, we'll watch. If not, we'll look at me looking to watch. God knows. I'm told that everyone knows my face on the internet. Everyone knows my face on the internet. Everyone knows me. There are no secrets. They know I'm a Jew who believes in Yeshua. In the people coming up to me saying hello. We don't believe in Jesus. We believe in what you want. So what he's saying is we do not believe in Yeshua. He's spitting on the ground because all he knows of, of, of Yeshua is that he was an evil man who led Israel into idolatry and that there's a straight line from the New Testament to the Holocaust. That's what he thinks. So I'm surrounded by these young, zealous, ultra-Orthodox Jews, and they're yelling and spitting on the floor. And, and, and ultimately, I got arrested that day, and then, let, I mean, they let me out because there was nothing to it. But as this was happening, God is my witness. I'm looking at them, seeing their sincerity, and I'm asking myself, I wonder how God's going to save them. I wonder if it's going to be dreams and visions like the Muslims are getting. I want, how is God going to do it? Because as surely as I'm standing here, there'll be a multitude of people just like that who become fervent followers of Yeshua the Messiah. So Isaiah 32 paints this picture. 
And, and, and it speaks of a, a terrible time of judgment. We'll start in verse 37. Tremble, you complacent women. Shudder, you daughters who feel secure. Strip off your clothes, put sackcloth around your waist, beat your breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vines, and for the land of my people, a land overgrown with thorns and briars. Yes, mourn for all houses of merriment and for the city of revelry. The fortress will be abandoned, the noisy city deserted. Citadel and watchtower will become a wasteland forever. The delight of donkeys, a pasture for flocks. It's a miserable picture until, until, the Spirit is poured upon us from on high. And now look at how everything changes. And the desert becomes a fertile field. And the fertile field seems like a forest. Justice will dwell in the desert. And righteousness live in the fertile field. The fruit of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. Desolation. Destruction. Barrenness of land, people under judgment, and suddenly this picture is transformed to beauty and to fruitfulness and to glory and to righteousness. What made the difference? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It would be just as if the natural land was parched and the plants had died and the cattle was dying, and the people were dying, and then torrents of rain and showers of rain and downpourings of rain came, and next thing, everything is fertile and flowing and fruitful, and people and animals are thriving again. That's a natural picture of what happens when the Holy Spirit comes. Now, I, I wanna be honest with you, friends. We often think of the outpouring of the Spirit, and we think just in terms of the church, or just in terms of world missions, or just in terms of supernatural signs and wonders in the Muslim world, and we often don't think of it in terms of Jewish ministry, in terms of Israel. But friends, Israel's salvation is just as dependent on the Holy Spirit as anyone else's salvation. And just the same, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will bring the same supernatural results among the Jewish people that it brings in the Gentile world. You know, in Reinhard Bonnke's autobiography, Living a Life of Fire, he tells extraordinary stories of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Here God calls this German evangelist as a boy to be a missionary, an evangelist to Africa. And God gives him this word that Africa shall be saved. And, and, and his first and foremost priority is to preach the gospel. But in preaching the gospel, they also pray for the sick. And he would talk about how these miracles would take place. And next thing, the crowds would come flocking. He was in one African nation. And the leader of that nation was a despotic ruler. He had put down other powers. He was basically ruler for life. And he ruled with an iron hand. And Bonke's preaching in his, in his country and doesn't know what kind of reception that he'll get. But God is moving in the country. He gets a message in the morning that, that the, the, the leader of the country wants to meet with him. And can he get there for lunch? So he showers, puts on his best suit, is praying about what to do, and meets with this man. This man has multiple wives. One of his wives is there. And begins to, the, the, the leader of the country begins to tell Bonky a story. And, and, and he tells him, about a little girl who was in the meeting last night known to his wife's family. And she was deaf and dumb. And she was instantly healed in the service. And when he got word of it, he ended up inviting Bonky to come and gave him an open door to preach in his nation. He's in another country and, and Muslim radicals came to the, country, uh, to, to the meeting. And he didn't know about this until afterwards, but they brought a blind man with them. And they made an agreement that if this blind man is not healed, they had stones under their garments. They were ready to take the stones out and start heaving them at Bonky. And it turns out that during the service, as God was moving, the man was instantly healed, begins to shout, I can see, I can see. And people didn't know what was happening. They just saw stones falling out of the guy's garments, found out the story afterwards. But hear me, the same God 
that, that heal the deaf and the blind and the dumb in Africa. And the same God doing these extraordinary miracles around the world is the same God who has promised to pour out his spirit on Israel, on the Jewish people. And if there's anyone in the Bible with a promise of national salvation, praise God for the word Africa shall be saved to blood-washed Africa from Cape Town to Cairo. And there have been tens and tens and tens of millions of people converted in recent years. What's happened in, in South Africa, especially sub-Saharan South Africa, is almost unprecedented in world history in terms of church growth. God's moving in extraordinary ways. And I believe God spoke that to Bonke, Africa shall be saved. But how much more did God say, all Israel shall be saved? How much more is that a promise written in the word? And as much as we have promises in scripture about the Holy Spirit moving all over the earth, we have specific promises that the Holy Spirit will be poured out in the land of Israel. And this is of critical importance because we do everything we know how to do. Look, Paul would go in the synagogues and debate and dialogue, and we seek to do those kinds of things. And you get the word out through every possible means. Now this amazing open door through Shalanu TV, getting the gospel out in Hebrew. But all of us understand that whatever we do, the Holy Spirit has to do the work, and the Holy Spirit has to open hearts, and the Holy Spirit has to open minds. Look at what's written in Acts, the second chapter. And remember, this is not part of a Pentecostal church Bible, okay? This, this takes place at Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, in Jerusalem, by the temple, and these are Jews involved. And if there's any people that Scripture says require a sign, it's Jews. In fact, it's a fascinating thing. But if you will check cults, false religions, you will find a disproportionately high percentage of Jewish people involved. The, the number one leading group in terms of converts to Buddhism in the Western world in recent decades has been Jews. Despite our small numbers, people looking for more, thinking there's gotta be more. There's even a term, some of you know, maybe some of you were this, Jubus, it's actually a term. I spoke to a leader of the Hare Krishna movement over a decade ago in New York City, and he told me at the height of the Hare Krishna movement, 75% of the world leaders were Jews. Think, how in the world would something like that happen? People looking for more, people knowing there has to be more, but looking in the wrong places. We alone have the ability through the gospel to bring people into a living encounter with the real, true God. Where God shakes a life, where the conviction of sin gets so intense, people can't run from it, and they, they can't drink it down or drug it down because the conviction is too intense, and then something happens where the Holy Spirit opens hearts, open minds, and moves supernaturally. We have a team that's in northern Iraq in Kurdistan, grads from our ministry school that are serving there. And with the, the civil war in Syria and the upheaval there, hundreds of thousands of refugees move right near where they are. So they have an incredible opportunity to, to do good and to share the good news. And the wife of one of our grads was ministering to a refugee woman, a Muslim woman. The woman was deaf in one ear. But previously she had been in a terrible accident, was badly burned. And the grad's wife was sharing the gospel with her and talking to her about Jesus. And she said, I love Jesus. But she didn't really know the rest of the message. She didn't know who he was. The Quran only says certain things about him. But she said she was in a terrible accident and was badly burned. And a number of other women badly burned with her. And they were in a hospital. They were all in the same ward room together. And one by one they were dying and she realized, I'm going to die. And then she has a dream or vision, didn't know what it was. And in it, there is Jesus. And he takes her to this water and washes her. And, and after this, she's completely healed. She doesn't die, she's not burned, she's fine. She wants to find out who this Jesus is. Here a missionary comes, shares the good news with her, prays for her, her ear is healed. And after that, she becomes a disciple. I heard that story, and we've heard many stories similar from other friends, and I'm thinking, 
Isn't it time that God starts doing that more in the Jewish world? Isn't it time when God starts doing it more in the religious Jewish world? There's one man, very, very religious background, born and raised in Israel in an ultra-Orthodox family. We just heard his story recently, that he had a dream and he saw all these famous rabbis and they all had an aura around them. There was a light around them that was just supernaturally bright, it seemed. They, They were very special. But then he saw another, and the light on this one was so transcendent that that it completely overshadowed the others with the brightness of the presence of the glory on this person. And he understood the dream, it was Rabbi Yeshua. This is an ultra-Orthodox Jew has this dream and doesn't know what to do with it. And others come and share the gospel. These things are happening, but it's only a trickle. I'm looking forward to the flood where the Holy Spirit's poured out so dramatically People are drenched with the presence of God and with the conviction of sin and with a revelation of Yeshua. Right, look at what's written here in, in Acts, the second chapter. You know the account, the Holy Spirit's been poured out, the Ruach's been poured out, and people are now speaking in languages and the Jewish crowd that's gathered for Shavuot, one of the feasts that they'd be in Jerusalem for. They're hearing the message in their own language, but something, well, What's going on? People are drunk. They don't know what to make of it. Then Peter stood up, beginning in verse 14, stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Remember, there was only one Bible that they had. It was the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures, the Tanakh. They didn't have something called the Old Testament and something else called the New Testament. The the only Bible they had was the Hebrew Bible. And when he's trying to find out what's happening, what's going on, he goes back to the Scriptures. Now, now in Hebrew, in Joel 2.28, or it's it's 3.1 in Hebrew, it says, And after this, I'll pour out my spirit. But Peter, wanting people to understand what's happening now, he puts in the words, in the last days. He wants them to understand this is a last days outpouring. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Yes, all people, but first and foremost, he's talking about the Jewish people. Your sons, your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on those days and they will prophesy. And it goes on. And then verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Wow. As a result of the outpouring of the spirit, people will be crying out to God, left and right and coming to know him and getting saved. Some of you may have visited Pensacola during the Brownsville Revival. Something happened. The Holy Spirit was poured out. Something tangible broke on Father's Day of 1995. And suddenly there was a a presence of God that had not been there before. There was a moving of God that had not been there before. And people began to come. They began to flock. God began to draw them. There was no human promotion making it happen. It was the Holy Spirit and word of mouth. As as the the weeks went on and the months went on, the crowds were so large that, that people would line up 12 hours before the meeting started. Actually, 12 hours before the doors opened. So they'd get online at 6 a.m. to wait until 6 p.m. Think of that. And some of them weren't even saved. One young lady ended up getting saved, going to our Bible school and becoming a missionary to Tanzania. She, she showed up with her mom thinking she was going to the beach. Mom said, come on, come on, we got to get up. What do you mean get up? Going to church? What do you mean going to church? We got to get up, go to church. Why are we getting up at five in the morning? Because we got to get online. What do you mean we got to get online? <laughs> How crazy is this? Get online at six in the morning for the doors to open at six at night, for the meeting to start at seven at night, to go to midnight, one in the morning, and people aren't even, people are getting saved standing in the parking lot. More than 300,000 different people saved or got right with God or repented of sin at those altars over the years. What happened? The Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit fell. 
I remember one night, photographer came in, atheist Jewish photographer, came into the meetings. Why are you even there? People are just drawn. I mean, in the early days, there was the first months of the revival, there was a photo shoot scheduled on the beach. Two Playboy bunnies were in town for a photo shoot, but there was hurricane type weather, so the photo shoot got canceled. So they decided to just go out and have fun that night. They asked the cab driver, where's the action in Pensacola? And he brought them to the church. <laughs> they ended up at the altar repenting. So this guy's in the meeting. He had done a photo exhibit on, on death and dying in America. Somehow he was into this kind of morbid stuff. Put that together in a collection. And there he is in the meeting. Sits through the whole night of worship. Great worship, he's not moved. Sits through Steve Hill preaching his heart out. Great message, he's not moved. Altar call, he doesn't respond, but he's still there. And to the meeting, one of my friends asked, would you like prayer? Yes, so we prayed for him, and next thing the Holy Spirit fell on him, and he's laying on his back, crying, shouting out, Jesus, Jesus. Then he goes, but I don't believe in Jesus. I mean, this is right there on his back with everybody around him, eyes closed. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But I don't believe in Jesus. And then finally just Jesus, Jesus. He gets wonderfully saved. He calls on the name of the Lord. He gets saved. He ends up putting together an award-winning photo exhibit on lives changed in the Brownsville revival. I mean, that, but that's what happens when God comes. You know, our friend Jonathan Burnus with, with Jewish Voice, before he was with Jewish Voice, God sends him over to the former Soviet Union. And it's harvest time. And next thing, tens of thousands of people are flocking into meetings, stadium meetings, preaching the gospel. It was one of those moments when the Holy Spirit was moving. It's like when many of us got saved in the early 70s. Any former hippies here? You know the saying, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. Yeah, younger crowd, they don't get that. <laughs> but I mean, all over the world, hippies, radicals, rebels getting saved in the most dramatic fashion. Just coming in, you know, here you come in with your, you know, beads and long hair and wearing some toga and sandals. And Why are you walking into a traditional church? But here we, we get saved one after another. Something was happening. The Holy Spirit was moving. I didn't know it was part of a worldwide phenomenon when I got saved. I just knew that that's when God drew me and drew my other friends to the Lord. But then you begin to hear other stories and other stories and other stories. Then you begin to travel around the world and hear how many got saved. It was an outpouring of the Spirit. And friends, I, I know it's going to happen in ways we've never dreamed of or imagined. And I know God's going to save the best for last but the ultimate work of the Spirit, if there's one place where I know that I know, where I can be guaranteed and sure, there will be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit with radical transformation and salvation. It is in Israel and in Jerusalem. A Jewish Jerusalem is going to welcome back the Messiah. Religious Jews are going to be crying out his name. And all over Israel, every part, people are going to be dramatically touched. And, and listen... I honestly believe if God could show us now what's going to happen, we'd think we were all dreaming. Too ridiculous. Too, nobody would script it like this because it's too ridiculous. But that sounds just like the God we serve who sent his son to die for the rebellion of his creation. Who would have scripted that? Save the world through the crucifixion of a Jewish carpenter. Who would have scripted that? Come on, just the second coming, the fact it's actually going to happen. He's going to appear in the clouds. We're going to be caught up to be with him. We're going to become like him. That's beyond anything we can imagine. We need to start dreaming dreams and praying big prayers and, and thinking in impossible terms about what God is going to do. And, and listen, we rejoice with one Jewish person that's open to hear more. We're thrilled. We, we get thrilled when we hear through our own ministry and someone writing and say, hey, through your writings, I, I, I've come to faith that was a key thing in my life. I mean, it means the world to us. We're thrilled. Every single one counts. But I'm telling you, God's going to multiply this. And God's going to intensify it. When the Holy Spirit is poured out, impossible things happen. 
And you can read about revivals in past history. And the reason we can talk about them, they started here, they ended here, is because something different, something tangible happened. Just like you can say, yeah, we had rain for five straight days. So you can talk about, you know, the Welsh revival of, of 1904, 1905, or the prayer revival of 1857, 1858, or the Hebrides revival of 1949 to 1952, or the Brownsville revival of 1995 to 2000. You can, you can look at these things in tangible ways because the moving of the Spirit is real and definite and tangible. And, and God delights in doing impossible things. In fact, it's a way that he receives the glory, not us. And he works through unlikely vessels so that none of us could ever think it's us, it's all him, it's all by his power. You know, one of my favorite stories from the Brownsville Revival, I've shared it many a time because it's so illustrative. I heard it directly from the pastors. I was speaking at a church in New Jersey. They had been in a moving of the spirit for about two years after visiting Brownsville. And the pastor, senior pastor said, let me tell you what happened. He said, I came down with four pastors. So five of them together. And they were in the meetings for a few days and they were blessed and they were prayed for, but candidly, they were expecting more. They got on the plane to fly home. And there's a saying, if you live in Pensacola, you go to heaven by way of Atlanta. In those days, Pensacola was even a smaller airport than now, and it was completely regional. So you, you had to go Pensacola into another city and somewhere else. So Pensacola, Atlanta, and somewhere from there. Pensacola, Memphis, and, and somewhere from there, depending on which airline you were using. So they were on Delta, so it was Pensacola to Atlanta. Not even a 40-minute flight. And they had five tickets, they had booked them together, and they get on the plane, it's everyone is separate. What happened? I mean, we were supposed to be one, two, three, four, five, just going across. Everybody's separate. What happened to our, our tickets? They have no clue. One over here, one there, all separate on the plane. And the pastor, to his absolute shock, is overcome by the Holy Spirit on the plane. Not in the meeting, not during the preaching, not at the altar call, not as we're laying hands on him, not as we're praying fire. No, no, on the plane, by himself, separated from his friends. He's completely overcome and weeps the entire flight. He can't wait to get off the plane to tell his friends, only to find out it happened to all five simultaneously, independently. And, and they realized, they realized it was God's way of saying, you see, it wasn't the crowds, it wasn't the emotion, it wasn't the music, it wasn't the preacher. There was no manipulation. And that's what they needed. And when God came and touched them, they went into their service that night and the Holy Spirit fell. And for two years, the Holy Spirit had been moving. Friends, we need a fresh move of the Spirit in Jewish ministry. We need a fresh move of the Spirit in the nation of Israel. We need a fresh outpouring so that as the gospel goes forth, it goes forth, as Paul said to the Thessalonians, not just in word, but in power. Boom! There's a punch to it. There's a force to it. There are arrows of conviction. There's, there's life that comes with it. There's hope. There's transformation. Look, when Yeshua starts his ministry in Luke, the fourth chapter, and begins his public work, after coming out of the wilderness, 40 days of fasting and being tested by the enemy, he quotes, this is Jesus, quotes from Isaiah 61, Ruach Adonai Elohim Alayat Mashach Adonai The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Peter, speaking to Cornelius and the other Italians, the Gentiles in, in Acts 10, explains how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the enemy. Yeshua himself, because he emptied himself of his divine privileges and prerogatives, worked miracles, healed the sick, preached and ministered by the anointing and power of the Spirit. He was anointed by the Spirit. And he said to his disciples in Luke 24, 49, don't leave the city until you're endued with power from on high. And that's where he reiterates again in Acts 1.8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And that's how they did what they did, by the same power, the same spirit that was on Jesus, on them. When Paul is preaching to the Corinthians, 
He explains afterwards in 1 Corinthians 2, he said, my preaching, my speech and preaching were not with persuasive words and human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power so that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Nothing's changed. Or can we do a better job than Jesus? Can we do a better job than Paul? If they relied on the power of the Holy Spirit, how much more do we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit? But hang on, if God worked through Paul, God can work through you and God can work through me. And Paul learned one great secret, that God's strength was made perfect in his weakness. Just regular human vessels, regular people. I want you to hear me tonight. When you pray, when you are in communion with God and you pray, God hears your prayers. And there's nothing more important than you can do than pray. And, and, and one of the most important things you could pray is, oh God, pour out your spirit on Israel. This is where it's all gonna come to a climax. I've been overseas almost 200 times ministering around the world, about to go to India for my 27th time and just my heart beats for the nations. If you have God's heart, you have a heart for the lost. If you have God's heart, you have a heart for the nations. But if you have God's heart, you also have a heart for Israel. And as the Holy Spirit's being poured out in nation after nation after nation, an amazing harvest of souls in Latin America, amazing harvest of souls in China, amazing harvest of souls in India and other parts of Asia, amazing harvest of souls in Africa, amazing harvest of souls in the Muslim world. We need to be saying, God, what about the Jewish people? What about the outpouring there? What about the signs and the wonders? What about the gospel just bringing down the, the greatest walls and the greatest obstacles? I have no question whatsoever that despite Jewish resistance to the gospel, there is a hunger in many Jewish hearts. I have no question, despite the worldliness and carnality of many Israelis, just like the rest of us, go to Tel Aviv, and it's like other big cities you've been to with all the problems and all the worldliness you can imagine. But I believe that behind that, there's something going on where people must know there's more. And even in the very religious world with all the devotion, and like any other religious people, you're gonna have the hypocrites among them. So many are missing something. So many caught up in legalism. So many realizing there must be more. And we have the answer. And believers within the land have the answer because they are right there. So I wanna encourage you, I wanna encourage you, be praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Israel. And around the world, wherever Jewish people are, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But I wanna encourage you even more specifically. It was not Jewish people who brought me to faith in Jesus. God saved me when I was a heroin shooting, LSD using 16 year old, long haired, hippie rock drummer. God saved me in exactly where you would figure God would save somebody like me. A traditional Italian Pentecostal church. <laughs> Who but the Lord would figure that out? And these people, they didn't know Hebrew. Many didn't even have a high school education, but they knew God. And they were full of the Lord and they were full of joy and they were full of the spirit and they prayed me into the kingdom. I mean, it's 48 years now just celebrating that. They prayed me into the kingdom and the vast majority of Jews that will come to faith around the world come to faith through the loving witness of Gentile Christians. God wants to use you and your life and the Holy Spirit at work in you to touch Jewish people. And if you say, I've never like prayed for the sick and seen a miracle, do you have a testimony? Has Jesus done something in your life? Do you have something to offer? You have no idea how God's gonna use you. So number one, pray. Pray for the outpouring. Pray for the moving of the spirit. If you look at other texts, you know, Ezekiel 36, as God brings the Jewish people back to the land out of captivity, what happens? He takes the stony heart out. He puts a fleshly heart in. He puts a new spirit, the Holy Spirit at work in the hearts and minds of people. He's doing it. And, and as much as the harvest in Israel 
is, is still very small in terms of those who've come to faith. It's night and day from what was in the early days. And the, the founding of the modern state of Israel in terms of Jewish believers in the land, they're probably what, less than 10? I mean, just literally a handful or two. How many? 25, so several hands. Two hands, two feet, and another hand. That's a generous number. I've, I've heard it was less than 10, but let's say 20, 25. Think of it in the whole nation, 25 believers. That's like three times Noah and his family that survived the flood. Unbelievable. And, and today, 20 or 30,000. Hey, it's not what you want it to be, but it's massively different than it was. Massively different than it was. What if this is just not addition, but multiplication? What if it's going to begin to intensify and intensify and intensify, not just in Israel, but around the world? I feel it in my bones as I'm speaking. Time for the harvest. So pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, for the moving of God, for God to reveal himself in, in signs and wonders and dreams and supernatural ways, and for the anointing of the Spirit to be on these Hebrew-speaking congregations. The anointing on the spirit to, to be on Avi Mizrahi and the work that they're doing, Dugit, and Ma'oz and the work that they're doing in Israel and around the world and the Tikkun congregations and the Shalanu network and METV and others that are preaching the gospel. Pray for the moving of the spirit. Just think, if the arrow is pulled back further, the, 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 the arrow, the tip is going to go out more and more and more, pierce more and more hearts. Pray that it won't just be excellent production as these, as these shows are being filmed, but the Holy Spirit will be there. Hey, we're spiritual. That must be some kind of sign or something, right? Paul, that wasn't like a $5,000 guitar that got damaged, was it? Uh, an expensive cello. Well, if that's the Holy Spirit, then that cello is fine. And everyone noticed I didn't push it. I didn't touch the cello. Yeah, go ahead and check on that. But we trust the... I just want to say this honestly. I've been preaching since 1973. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of messages. And this is the first time in my life a cello was slain in the spirit while I was speaking. <laughs> cello Okay. Looks good, don't know. Don't drop it on the way out. Either that or Celebration Church has a hokey way of telling you you're out of time. I don't know which. Maybe the cello was in the flesh, you think so? Or if you're Baptist, it just wasn't put down properly. Well, I mean, no, I mean, it's... Okay, I, I got to close here, and I was really on a run, all right? So I've got to kind of get revved up again to come to the preacher's climax here. But, but okay, just, just let me say this. What I mean is, if you are Pentecostal, and there's a problem with the mic, you rebuke demons. If you're Baptist, you change the battery. Okay, that, I'm just saying they're different men. That's all I'm saying. Sometimes one side's a little bit more pragmatic, and the other can be a little hyper-spiritual. That was more of a joke about us, okay? It's all the Baptists. I was, if I was trying to be offensive, I'd be offensive. I have no problem doing that. But that was, it's a ni it was a nice comment. This man is a nice comment. All right, so let me get revved back up here. So, and this, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. Joy is a good thing, right? This is not carnal joy. We're in the house of God, this is good joy. So pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Pray for God to really use, look, things, the word's getting out in many ways. Pray that it'll be supernaturally anointed. And then say, Lord, here am I. What can I do? I mean, you've given tonight, that's amazing. You're gonna be praying, but you never know how God wants to use you, how your life can intersect with the life of a Jewish person. And you can be the one that brings them to Yeshua. And you could be an answer to those prayers. Hey, I want you to stand, stand your feet together with me. And here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we're gonna do. Could we just have uh, Ron come up and, and Avi and John Burnus? Is Kobe here? Okay. Yeah, Jeff Bernstein, come on up. I just want us to pray representatively for these gentlemen representing all the outreach you heard from Tikkun, 
Sabra, native born Israeli, right there in the land. John with his international ministry and reaching African Jews. Kobe, now leading Maoz, which is one of the key ministries to alert the church and to join them with Israel. And Jeff Bernstein, longtime friend, frontline soul winner here trying to win Jewish people to the Lord in America. Oh, Abba Shalom, yeah, please come on up. Come on up as well. Now, Hannah, come on up. So just to show that we don't, we're, we're, we allow women up here too. <laughs> so representing the nations joining together for the salvation of Israel and greater Haifa. All right, so here's what we want to do. I, I want us to pray for them. And Paul, come on up to join me to pray. We're going to pray for them, just representative, asking for a fresh touch of the Spirit, asking for greater anointing, greater outpouring, something supernatural to break. All right, let's pray for them. And then I want to just pray a short prayer for everyone here that the Holy Spirit would fall afresh in your lives, that you'd encounter him in a deeper way and that he would use you, all right? So Paul, let's, let's pray for them together. Everybody raise your voices as we pray for these men and women of God and the ministries they represent. Father, we thank you for the millions of lives that have been touched through these standing here, literally, and, and for, for this transformation, for the outpouring, for the congregations planted, for the lives saved, for, for eyes opened, for the miracles you've done, Lord. But we pray that you would turn things up. We pray for multiplication. Lord, as one could chase a 1,000, two can chase 10,000. So I pray for fresh and mighty outpouring of the Spirit. Lord, for an increase, for a supernatural increase. Lord, for something more, even for expanding of vision, expanding of vision beyond the possible. Oh, for the anointing to do what cannot be done. A statesman, a statesman in Yeshua's name, by your Spirit, for Jewish soul for Jewish souls, for an army raised up, an army to go and win the lost and make disciples. Lord, for supernatural grace, for the broken, for the hurting, for the outcast, for those in need, for supernatural grace, for miracles, Lord, and doors opening in high places. Give them grace, give them favor, grace and favor. Father, we lift our voices for the salvation of Israel once more. We lift our voices for the outpouring of your spirit once more and we pray for everyone here fresh touch of your spirit fresh touch of your spirit fresh touch of your spirit fill those who don't know you save those who are hurting Lord heal with your mighty power may faith rise may anointing increase may your spirit work dreams and visions outpouring of your spirit on your people we pray for it, O oh God, in Yeshua's name, in Yeshua's name, amen.